are you doing? I'm doing well. Welcome back to the Beer Knits podcast, where we talk about all things knitting, crocheting, sometimes cross-stitching, and a little bit of spinning here and there. Today's episode is a little bit different because I wasn't able to put anything out last week since I was over at our new house painting the walls. I'm actually getting ready to go over um, again right after I'm done recording this to go paint some more walls. Thankfully, we have friends joining us today, so it should go a little bit quicker. But with any luck, we'll be done with all of the painting by next weekend, so we can just start hauling everything over there. The reason this podcast episode or this extra, whatever we want to call it, is a little bit different is because I'm going to sit here and knit with you and answer some Q&As that people submitted over on Instagram and just kind of see where that takes us. I wanted to do something a little more low maintenance than the usual fare that I've been putting out lately just because I am both mentally and physically exhausted, but I do still enjoy making these videos and talking with other knitters and crocheters out in the world because um, even though our local community is really great, I still yearn for a larger crafting community and I think there's a lot to be said for it. So I before we get started, should probably talk about what I will be working on today. This is my second Av sweatshirt by Brianna Lupino of The Little Wolf Knits, and this is in her, I think it's the We Like It colorway from her cereal collection on her schooner base, which is a Vu Clay. And this is the second second Av sweatshirt that I've knit. I finished one earlier in the year, um, I guess in July. It must have been late June, early July when I finished that. And I liked it so much that I wanted to make another one. This is in more Christmassy colors. I'm thinking this might be one of my holiday sweatshirts that I wear um, when we go to parties and stuff like that. So we'll see how it turns out. But I'm at a point where it is a fairly mindless knit. So if we're going to sit here and chat about things, then I might as well be productive, but I also need some brain power to answer questions. And I can't do that if I need to also be counting. So I'm at a point where I just kind of knit around in a circle for, the pattern says eight inches. For me, it's more like 13, 14 inches because I have a longer torso and the sweatshirt is designed to be cropped and I'm not a big fan of cropped. So so uh, if I don't want it to be a belly shirt, then I need to knit it a little bit longer. So that's what we are working on today. Feel free to grab one of your projects as well. I know I don't need to give you permission, but it is highly encouraged um, if you're joining me on this new journey today. And let's start digging into the questions, I guess. All right, so this is one that people ask me a lot, and I don't really know how to respond, so I'm going to do my best. Um, this question is, do you love what you do for work? All the stress, I just want to tell you to quit because it's not worth it. Um, to be honest, I agree. I don't think any of, I don't think work stress is worth it in any job. Maybe if you're like a doctor or a first responder or something like that. Um, but I do enjoy my job and I guess to explain why I like my job and why I deal with the stress, I should probably explain what I do. And even when I'm done explaining, I, my experience is people still don't understand what I do. My family still doesn't know what I do. My friends, unless they're in the same industry, don't know what I do. So we'll see where this lands. So I work in marketing operations. And contrary to what a lot of people assume when they first hear that, I don't work in marketing. There is a rather lengthy and large debate going on over on LinkedIn about whether marketing operations is part of marketing. Historically, I would have said we're not. We focus on more of the technology side of things and we support marketing and getting their campaigns out. So the type of things that we do 
are we take a look at lead flow? How are people getting in the database? How do we capture where they came from and what they did after that? What's their engagement like? How do we make sure that those people are getting correctly assigned to uh, sales reps? when they do, when they engage with like a, a sales signal, um, what are high intent buying signals? How do we identify those to ensure that we're getting people to sales at the right time? How do we ensure that the leads coming in aren't junk? How do our all of our technologies that marketing uses fit together in a holistic way that we don't take down the entire system and life cycle? And so that's the type of thing that I am tasked with solving. It's very much, although we support marketing, we very much are, we function like IT and technology. If you work in sales, it's very similar to sales operations where you have a team who supports you using Salesforce and sales after outreach or all those technologies that integrate with uh, Salesforce to support your sales functions, but they aren't actually part of sales. So I don't do paid media. I don't do advertising. I don't do organic search. I don't make PDFs. I don't develop content. I don't do any of that. Um, I make sure things work. And now I would say I'm kind of leaning toward though that marketing operations is part of marketing, but someone needs to tell marketing that we're part of marketing because so frequently marketing operations is asked like, well, you're in the data and you know how to read the data and you see what's coming in. Can you lead the discussions with marketing? Can you be involved earlier to make sure that all of this stuff works so that we can report on things? Or what's your, what's your advice based on what you're seeing? Um, and I do realize that part of that is data literacy issues, and I've had many conversations with people about how the more removed the marketing function gets from managing all of the technology, the more they're losing those data literacy skills. But that, that's a whole issue in and of itself. But they do tend to rely on us a lot for information. Now, the reason that I say they need to be convinced that we are actually part of marketing is because we can give them that information until we're blue in the face, but unless and until they are held to different metrics, they're not going to take our advice. So, for example, um, a lot of departments, I know this is really boring, but I also know that a lot of you also work in marketing or marketing operations, so this is important. Um, a lot of departments are still measuring marketing performance on raw MQLs coming into the database. So for example, just because you download a PDF doesn't mean that you want to be followed up by a sales rep, right? Um, you only want to be followed up by a sales rep if you are um, engaging with sales indicating behavior. So filling out contact forms, um, signing up for a trial or a demo of a product, or you've engaged, you know, five times over the past week with something, you came to an event, you sat through a an informative, you know, webinar and then downloaded more content after that. Um, so those are, so in a lot of companies, that's kind of what a marketing qualified lead is. It is a, what I consider vanity metric. It doesn't really mean anything because you can adjust your definition of MQL based on whoever's in charge. And a lot of times marketers will bully marketing operations to adjust the definitions of MQLs so that it looks like their campaigns are performing better than they are. So unless and until companies start uh, measuring marketing performance on the quality of the leads instead of how many leads they're bringing in, and a lot of companies make that mistake of not doing that, um, <laughs> we can't give them advice because all of the advice that MOPS, marketing operations, is going to give them is about getting higher quality leads and they don't wanna hear it. So I agree that MOPS should be involved in the marketing conversation, but I don't think MOPS are the people who need to come to terms with that. I think marketing is because they do not wanna listen. In any event, so that's what I do for a living. It is high stress because I manage a global team of campaign operations who are responsible for helping marketing launch their campaigns, but I'm also on the strategic uh, quasi-leadership team. I'm, 
in the organization, I'm technically like director level status. So I am also involved in the strategic architecture behind all of these platforms. So I get involved in conversations that I may or may not want to for better or worse. And it can be a lot of pressure when people aren't measured on the wrong things to gauge performance and uh, poor planning always equals an emergency on our parts. So if our events team, for example, doesn't send stuff over by the date that they were supposed to, then we need to scramble slash work all hours to get things out the door. Um, also, because I work for a cybersecurity company, we may or may not have a security incident that requires us to send what's called a transactional email to all of our customers. That can happen at all hours of the day. So we are always on call in case something happens and we need to get those notifications out the door. Um, I do not recommend campaign operations to anyone. I'm not sure I even like it. I would rather be in platform operations, <laughs> honestly, where we focus on the actual systems, but it is what it is. I'm in this role because I was in platform operations and I was hired because I could bring the strategic lens to the campaign operations side of things. So that's really what I'm focused on other than leading the team. The issue and why uh, I seem so disgruntled other than the long hours is that we are a fast growing publicly traded cybersecurity company in the Bay Area, but we are, you know, growing really quickly. We're scaling to enterprise. We are technically an enterprise, but we're trying to get to a certain level of enterprise, but we still have a lot of people who are focused in the startup mentality, which we were for many years. And what that leads to is a lot of high performers within the company with no enterprise experience. And so people are leaning in a little too hard to other roles, they're solutioning where they shouldn't be solutioning, which means that you are building uh, bad technology integrations um, and lead flow and things like that just to get the work done. And eventually what happens there is that you paralyze all of your technology. Um, if you do not build holistically, if you do not build to scale, you're going to reach a point where eventually you can't build anything at all. You can't make changes to anything and uh, none of your technology is going to work and you pigeonhole yourself into things that you really don't want to be doing, which means that you can't grow as a company. We are kind of at that point or we were about to get to that point when I started and I have in the past worked as a consultant for this technology. So the technology that I mainly use is Marketo, which is an Adobe product. I've spoken at Adobe Summit, Marketo Summit, a lot of Marketo user groups, Adobe user groups. Um, I've done a lot of public speaking about this. So I like to think that I'm experienced. And I also, this is a Marketo champion. <laughs> sure, I was what they, what is a, they consider a champion um, from 2016 to, I think it was 2021. And what that means is you're considered a power user slash expert in the community, and they only choose 40 champions um, globally every year. And so that's the expertise that I bring to the table and the experience that I bring to the table is that I was a consultant for many, many, many years. I have worked with, for, and in many enterprise companies. And so when I stepped into this company and uh, have to deal with a whole bunch of people who are acting like we're a startup, it can be very frustrating um, for a number of reasons. One is just because like you wake up every day and get questions and you're just like, what? <laughs> like, what even is this question? Did you think this through? People want you to implement like just horrible, horrible ideas, which goes back to like they're solutioning the tech for you. And you're just like, there are 400 other ways to do this. This is not what you want to do. And you have to walk them back from that. And that can be very difficult. I would say my issue with my job right now is all about behavioral stuff, less process stuff, more behavioral 
stuff. Um, you can get people to follow a process as much as you want, but unless you change their behaviors and their ways of thinking, they're not going to. And so that's where I am as um, a growing leader within the company is figuring out how do I talk to people to change their behaviors so I'm not working 18 hours a day because they think they can do my job. Um, just as an aside and what I have to deal with, I was on a call with a consultancy the other day and they basically mansplained how to integrate these two systems together. And I'm not the type of person to be like, do you know who I am? But like, you can Google me and figure out who I am. And they're trying to tell me how to install this package that I've literally given multiple <laughs> user group uh, speeches about and they're like well let's pull it up and we'll just show you what we're talking about and I was like no no I'm fine so there's also the element of being a woman in tech that makes things really extra hard nobody wants to listen to you and I think there's also the fact that I look like I'm really young I don't think people would guess that I'm 41 most of the time usually when I tell people that they're like oh I had no idea and so they assume that like every day is my first day on the job, which is funny because I think the same about them half the time. But when I walk into meetings with people, they aren't keen to listen to what I have to say at first. And I think it's because I look like I'm young and inexperienced when in reality I have a lot of credentials. I am a certified Marketo user. I'm a certified architect. I have an MBA. Um, I think I can I can speak to these things if you're willing to give me a chance. But that oh, that also goes back to just um, whether or not people think that what I do is actually part of marketing. Anyway, I'm hiring uh, two headcounts in multiple regions, Amia and APJC. So if you if you wanna if you wanna come and be crazy with me, you know, let me know. Next question, how many advents do I have coming this year? And it's funny because I actually decided to track them this year so I wouldn't go overboard and then I went overboard anyway. But I do have good reason for that. One is that I work really hard and lose my mind so I can afford to do it. And the other reason is that people came out with really cute advents this year and I just kind of wanted them. So I actually have 10, <laughs> advents that I bought this year and let's see one is a fiber advent from pancake and lulu one is the caterpillar cross stitch advent so their fiber well I guess the pancake lulu one is fiber but like they're they're yarn adjacent I suppose they're crafty um and two of them are self-striping socks so they're not really full advents right yeah so I got the Freckled Whimsy and the Cozy Knitter 24 Stripe Self-Striping uh, sock sets because I was only going to do the Freckled Whimsy one, but I'm a completionist, so I did the Cozy Knitter one. I really enjoyed it last year. I know there were a lot of complaints about that one and how there wasn't a lot of definition between the colors slash stripes, so it was hard to do day to day. She said she's addressing that for this year, and I have all of them, so... I'm gonna do it again. But I am really excited for the freckled whimsy one because that just looked so beautiful last year. So I think it's gonna be amazing again. I'm also getting Southern Skeins DK weight. Um, the colors on that look like they're going to be amazing. They're kind of elf colors, which are bright blues, greens, yellows, reds, whites, things like that, which to me are sort of modern traditional. And I really like that color scheme. So I'm excited about that. My The one that I'm most looking forward to this year is the Muppet Christmas Carol Advent Calendar. And I forget who's dying that because I almost didn't care. Like I heard there was gonna be a Muppet Christmas Carol Advent Calendar and I lost my, my mind. So I needed to get that immediately. So that's going to be that and one of the self-striping socks sets are going to be the ones that I work on every day and the rest are gonna be as I get to them as I have time, which I won't have, but it's fun to dream. I got the Homespun House Yarn Advent, the Pancake and Lulu Fiber Advent, the Yarn Ink Friends Advent. That seemed necess both necessary in my life because I loved Friends growing up, but also with Matthew Perry passing away, I had some emotional moments last year. It just seemed like I needed to do it. The Ruby and Roses Advent 
and the fangirl fiber is Beauty and the Beast Advent. Beauty and the Beast is my favorite Disney movie. Belle is my favorite Disney princess. I could not look away. So did I go overboard on the advents? Yes, I did. Can I afford to do it? Yes, I can. Will I eventually make projects out of the, this, these advents? Sure thing. Um, I have so many advent projects saved and I love working with minis, so it is going to happen some day. Uh, you guys know me, I'm always knitting something. I will get through my stash, no doubt about it. And this year, because we bought a new house, I am cutting back on how much I add to my stash. Bought all these before we decided to do that. So this should keep me busy as I work my way through my stash to, you know, not go so hog wild in the future. I'm really excited about all of them. But relatedly, I was also asked if you had to pick one Yarny Christmas Advent, which would it be this year? Definitely the Muppet Christmas Carol. That is probably my favorite Christmas movie. And I'm, I don't know what it's going to look like. I have no expectations. I just know that despite what the yarn looks like, I'm going to really enjoy the experience. I'm going to watch Muppet Christmas Carol while I work on it. And I'm really looking forward to that. So I think out of all of them, that's the one I'm looking forward to the most. If I talked about which advent I look forward to the most every year, it's probably a tie between the Cozy Knitter self-striping advent because I love working on those. They're really quick to work up. I do them two at a time on two sets of DPNs and I just knit a stripe on each every morning. It worked out really well last year. It took maybe, I don't know, 20 minutes <laughs> to do that every day. It's attainable. Uh, you, you knock it off in bite-sized chunks and it really does feel like an accomplishable knitting advent within the advent season. Um, so it's a tie between that or the Ruby and Roses advents. Um, I've gotten her past two that her last one's actually hanging behind me. I'm going to have to move that soon. And they're just gorgeous. Her yarns are gorgeous and her advents have been amazing and the little goodies that come with them too. She almost, I don't know if it's coming this year, but she almost always includes like a candle that smells like a pine tree and that's amazing and then usually like a bar of lotion or something like that and those have been really great too so that's the one those are the two that i probably look forward to the most on a recurring basis the next one is how do you find such an adorable and supportive husband i can't imagine who submitted that <laughs> but I'm going to answer it anyway. Uh, Bumble. <laughs> I had given up on dating apps and this was before they even got really bad because my understanding is like trying to date right now on a dating app is probably the worst experience you'll ever have in your life. And I had given up. I had deleted the apps multiple times at that point and I had just installed it for funsies again. And my friend and I had gone to Nashville for a weekend and had a really great time and I came back from Nashville, saw he had matched with me and I, and I really liked his description because a lot of guys barely write anything about themselves on these dating apps. They're just kind of like, hi, I'm here, wanna go out and it's boring. His was interesting. We had a lot of common interests. We both really like craft beer, whiskey, bourbon, uh, traveling, road trips, things like that. So I decided to take a chance and it worked out. And here we are, we will be married for three years in October. The next question is, how much do you love your new house and do you have a favorite spot already? So love the new house. Like I said, I'm heading over there in a bit to do more painting. Scott's over there with the dogs right now, waiting for our friends to come over and help us while I do this. So yeah, we absolutely love the house. We've had to do some work on it, um, including a whole bunch of sewer work, which luckily the, the seller was required to do it to sell the house, but it was like $25,000 worth of sewer work, um, which could also happen to us when we go to sell our current house. So I can't... Uh, 
I'm afraid I'm gonna jinx things by being like, oh, thank God he covered it because it could also happen to us. Because what happens when you go to sell a house in our borough is that they require, I mean, they require you to something with the sewer. You have to, most people get a home inspection anyway, but they require you to fix stuff with the sewer before you leave is my understanding. And so we got the inspection, all of the sewer stuff failed because all, a lot of the houses in this area are older, like built in the 20s or earlier, like the 1920s. <laughs> um, and so, you know, the sewer pipes are pretty old. And when you're living in a house, unless you have issues, you don't think to get them checked out. So we had to get that fixed. We have a bunch of rooms that we want to paint. We um, have some projects that the owner before the previous owner had started in the house and never finished. So we want to finish some of those up, like installing a fireplace and things like that. A fake fireplace. It's not, it's not real. We don't have to like install a chimney or anything, but they, they had a really nice faux fireplace in the basement and we're going to move that up to the living room. Um, so given that I don't necessarily have a favorite place yet because we don't know or favorite place in the house yet because we don't have a lot of stuff in there, but Generally speaking, I love how much space there is. It's over 3,000 square feet, which is fantastic when you have a bunch of dogs who like to run around and also when I'm working from home and want to have a more secluded space to um, just get my work done. And it's almost like the upstairs had an in-law suite because you walk upstairs and there's just like this massive living area and there's a kitchenette. So my office is going to be upstairs with the kitchenette. So I can just put all of my coffee and tea supplies in the kitchenette, um, some of my refrigerated meals, things like that. So during the work day, I don't have to, you know, bounce up and down the stairs. I can just walk to the kitchenette and grab everything. But I think my favorite area right now, other than like my yarn room, which goes without saying, I think my favorite area right now is what we're turning into the library. So that big area at the top of the stairs that was um, kind of an in-law suite, it was almost like its own living room. We are building, well, Scott is building a bunch of bookcases and we're gonna turn that area into our library. And it's just so sunny, it's so big. I can't wait to like put a nice carpet in there with big cushiony chairs and plants and have that space to relax and just enjoy reading a book on occasion. So I'm really looking forward to that. Scott and I are both uh, prolific, is that the right word, readers. And so we have a lot of books. It'll be nice to have a single area to store them in. And then for the ones that I finish reading, I would love to install a little free library in front of our house. If you don't know what that is, definitely definitely feel free to look it up. It's a really cool idea. Um, I've wanted to do one for ages. Um, even when I was with my ex-husband in our old house, I wanted to do one. And I think I'm at a place where I can actually be a good steward of one. So yeah, that's our plan right now. I will try to take video when I go over today so you can see where we are with that. Um, but yeah, so not necessarily a designated favorite place just yet, but right now, if I had to choose, I'm leaning toward the library area. The next question is two part question. How do you fit in your knitting and what do you do while you're knitting? Uh, basically, if I'm sitting, I'm knitting. <laughs> uh, when I wake up during the week, I wake up early purposely to get about an hour of knitting in. So I wake up, I make coffee and my breakfast, and I sit down and I watch YouTube and I knit for about an hour. I may I might check work emails during that time. More often than not, I do just to clear out my inbox and get an idea of what my day is gonna look like, look at my calendar, but I can knit through all of that. Then the next nine to 10 hours are dedicated to just working. A lot of people can knit through meetings. Most of the time I can't because I'm leading them and have to take copious notes and documentation and things like that. On occasion though, I do have the opportunity to just sort of attend 
and listen. And in those scenarios, I knit under my desk. <laughs> uh, we have to be on video. It's required. I hate it. Um, but we have to be on video. So like something like this, though, I can just tuck it under my desk and knit while I'm watching. I'm going to have it still be informative. But most of the time, I cannot knit at work. And then after work, I usually take a breather for an hour. We'll eat dinner. We'll watch a show right now. We're finishing Ted Lasso. And then, you know, depending what I have going on, then I time block out my night every night. So sometimes I will have plenty of time for knitting and I will just do that while I'm watching podcasts. Either, either it's going to be true crime or knitting. Um, I'm really into the Grim Life Collective, which I believe I've mentioned before. Right now they're doing a whole lot of Halloween content, so I'm really enjoying that. And otherwise, um, it really depends what I have going on because lately I've been packing up my yard room or going over the house and painting or taping things off, things like that. So it just really depends, but I do make sure to squeeze in at least that full hour of knitting in every morning and then figure out how I work it into my day, depending on what's going on. But you can, you can almost rest assured that if my butt is in a chair, I'm probably knitting, and that is the only reason I'm able to get anything done. The next two questions are kind of related, so I'm going to wrap them into one, I suppose. Um, how many whips and foes do you have, and what is your oldest whip foe? I don't know how many. I, As I'm going through and packing up my craft room, I'm finding ones that I don't even remember starting. <laughs> So I, I don't know how many I actually have. Right now my current whips are maybe five because I have my Lily Scrap Blanket um, with last year's Haunted Mansion Halloween Countdown from Fangirl Fibers. I have the second Av sweatshirt. I have all of the Manhattan hats that I'm knitting for the guys and my family for Christmas. Um, I think that's actually it right now because I don't have any socks on the needles because Sockoween is coming up. So I want to have a fresh start and I know that I need to get like all of this stuff done before I get back into that. Plus I kind of wanted a break after summer sock camp. So I don't have any socks on the needles. So it might just be like three or four actually right now. That's wild. I'm not used to that at all, but those are my active whips right now. I know I have others floating around and my oldest whip hmm, is probably, it's either going to be the rainbow mitered square blanket from Knit Picks or a pair of socks that I started when I was dating a guy in England who I used to work with. And I had started a pair of socks and I was working on them the first time he came back to visit me and I was so depressed after he left that I just threw them in the bag and never looked at them again. And now they're, I, I think I found them a while ago and they're buried in a project bag under like 20 other project bags. So I'm pretty sure those are my oldest whip, oldest whips that I can think about right now. And I would love to finish the rainbow mitered square blanket from Knit Picks one of these days, but I've heard that they don't give you enough yarn. So I'm also kind of dreading finding that out. And I think that's why I put it off to the side to begin with was because <laughs> that news made me sad. And so I haven't revisited it. I have, I want to say, two and a half of the quadrants done. So I have the reds, pinks, yellows quadrant done. And I have the blues, greens, yellows quadrant done. And then I, so I started another one. And then there's another one that you still have to completely do. Um... So yeah, still a lot of work to go on that, and I don't know if I'm ever going to want to, given the fact I'm probably going to need to buy, like, a whole thing of yarn for at least two of the colors I've heard. So in the grand scheme of things, it's not actually terrible. It's just really depressing. All right, next is, what is the largest needle you have, and have you ever used it? Uh, I'm looking at my needle wall right now, and I want to say... I have a pair of size 15s. I can't remember what size they are, but it was the needle that I used to knit this thing, um, which was basically just roving. And it was from uh, We Are Knitters. And 
actually, I don't think those are the ones that I got. I think the needles that I got in that size from We Are Knitters broke, which I've heard is common. Um, and I, so I think I had to buy a replacement pair, but I think they were a size 15. Um, just because, you know, it's straight roving, not actually yarn. So it's really thick to work with. Um, so I think that's the biggest size that I have and I will probably never use them again. Prior to that, I had, it was really popular back in the day to knit with like six to 10 balls of yarn at the same time in different colors. And so people were getting these really thick, bright red straight knitting needles and those were huge. And they look like vampire stakes, to be honest. And they were really popular for a while. I started a project with them once and found it to be unwieldy and just really did not like it. So I think when I moved out of my last house, I just tossed them because I didn't think I would ever use them again. And looking at the big needles I used for this blanket, I'm probably never going to use them again either. So uh, yeah, those are probably the biggest needles that I have. And they were definitely for a single project. And, you know, if you want to knit the thing, then go ahead and knit the thing. But in hindsight, was it worth it? No, because now I just have more crap laying around and that's annoying. Last question is, I just finished nursing school and I'm looking for a project to get my mojo back. I'm still a beginner. Um, when I'm trying to get my mojo back, I try to find something kind of mindless, but it really depends on the goal. So usually when I lose my, like the will to knit, if you will, um, it's because I'm burned out, I'm tired, and I just don't want to think about something. So I will pick up something like this and just knit around mindlessly because then it still feels like I'm making progress without having to use my brain. But then there are other times where I get bored with knitting because what I'm working on isn't holding my interest. Either it's too easy um, or I just don't like what I'm working on. So, or at least I don't, maybe I don't like working on it at that time. Like it's just not fulfilling whatever that need is. So I think figuring out, you know, what that gap is, like what it is that you're yearning to knit, um, addresses that. But if you just don't even know where to start and you're trying to just get your mojo back, I think working on something in the round, that's just simple stockinette, even if it's just, you know, a scarf that you knit in the round on tiny needles, <laughs> maybe that's not good. Um, scarves to me just seem like endless nonsense. I don't know. Honestly, I knit socks. I'll just knit a vanilla sock. Um, as a beginner, I don't know if you really want to dive into the world of socks or if you ever have, but for me, it's usually I'll just pick up a plain vanilla sock. I'll find some pretty yarn that gets me excited to work on them and just knit around and around. And that's what I do. Sometimes I will also get excited to knit if there is a kit that I find somewhere. Um, for example, I just bought the Crochet Society Halloween box. Well, I bought it in July and it just came this past week. And that is making me excited to crochet something because I think the projects in there are just adorable. So sometimes looking at, you know, some of the kits that a lot of these companies have for sale will, will get my juices flowing again. So um, even if you don't want to do that particular kit, it'll give you an idea of something that maybe you want to make with your own stash and that that'll get me excited just to do something new. Um, so yeah, I guess the top three tips and tricks are A, identify, you know, what the issue is. Is it that you are, you just uh, want to get back into knitting more than knit something simple and mindless. If you're bored with your knitting, maybe try a different skill or a different type of yarn or something like that um, so that you have something that is challenging enough to work your brain a little bit. And then three, take a look at some of the kits that are on the market right now. See what's popular, see what's cool. Either buy it work something from stash, get an idea, something like that. Um, I find that is always really inspiring for me. All right, so that's it for this video. I have no idea how many 
Rose, I actually knit on this. I was worried it was gonna start pooling like my last sweater did, but so far so good. And I'm really enjoying it. I hope you enjoy this video as well. Again, it's a little bit different than usual, but I'm gonna go and destroy my body with paintbrushes and rollers. <laughs> so let me know if you have any other questions. Maybe I'll put it, or even if you like this video, because if that's the case, then I'll make another one at some point. I don't know. Um, if not, no worries. We don't have to do this. <laughs> um, I just thought it would be fun to do something a little bit different. Um, so yeah, let me know in the comments. If you like what you see, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Leave me any questions you want answered in a future video. And otherwise, I will see you for a regular podcast next week. Bye.